Okay, so these questions are a little bit more specific to retroblasting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this person wants to know if you and I had to spend a weekend doing anything except retroblasting related activities. So basically no toys, no cosplay, no Star Wars or collecting. What would we do? When you say no Star Wars, does that mean not watching it? Uh, no. I'll say no. Okay. Um, well, Melinda and I, uh, if we weren't working on retroblasting, uh, we'd probably uh, meet with friends, hang out a little bit, you know, maybe go get pizza with some of our, our closest friends. Uh, Joe Demons comes over from time to time. Uh, I might work on the car. Uh, we're getting the DeLorean back on its tires. Um, you know, there's there's a number of things that, that we do and have done. Right now we're on a television show binge. We're binge watching through Netflix on some series that we haven't seen before. Star Trek DS9. Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And we're, we're going to move on to uh, what we're moving on to after that. Maybe Voyager. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I'm going to have my noose ready. Um, and then... Uh, and then, uh, you know, other than that, we uh, we like to take, you know, vacations when we can get them. So if we weren't doing anything related to television, sci-fi, comic books, entertainment, you know, convention appearances, anything like that, if we just put everything away, even the, even the television watching, I'd say we would probably be, you know, finding a nice place in the mountains somewhere for the weekend and, you know, doing something like that. But that hasn't happened in a while. We've been pretty crazy busy, so. Honestly most of the time we are doing stuff that's in some way related to the channel whether it's yeah. watching new shows watching old shows that we never had a chance to watch it back in the day and using those ideas to come up with um, things to integrate into current scripts or writing new scripts and um, so a lot of the things we do even when we go out to like if we run to target we always look in the toy aisle so that we're up to date on what's going on so it kind of is an all-encompassing thing. Right. You know, retroblasting has kind of taken over our lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really has. But in a, in a good way. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and that's all due to you guys. So we you know, really appreciate you guys being enthusiastic and supportive. Right. Have you guys considered seeking out industry guests to discuss these retro toys and designers and things like that? Um, I can answer that to some degree. Um, I, I handle a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, which is why I'm not on camera as much as Michael here. Um, I, I manage the web page and I do a lot of the bookings and things like that. So I'm sort of the behind the scenes nerd. Um, and I, I have considered adding industry guests onto what we already do. The issue is just a matter of, of booking them in terms of scheduling and things like that and just figuring out exactly who we would want to include in that. It's not something that's off limits or anything like that. It's just a matter of trying to really stay focused on our content area. So um, it would need to be someone like a toy designer, um, someone like that. Um, but I, I think it would, it would certainly add a, a certain level of, of interest to, to some of our videos. So it's certainly something I'm thinking about. Yeah, and I, I did formally reach out to Hasbro to try and get an interview with them uh, for a, a specific video. We say so many great things about Hasbro. Well, <laughs> still, you know, as, as a professional PR person myself, you mm -hmm. know, I, the one thing you shouldn't do is shirk away from, you know, legitimate interviews. Right. So. Uh, so this person wants to know where they can get a t-shirt. Uh, if you remember a while back, uh, at the convention photos and things like that that we were posting, um, Michael and I and some of our friends have retro blasting t-shirts. And they those particular shirts were a very limited run that I had produced for conventions this, this year. Um, but we are toying with the idea of making retro blasting t-shirts on a larger scale and um, having them available for people to, to buy if, if, they're, if we find that you guys are actually interested in such a thing. So it's really just a matter of, of um, getting a large amount of money together to buy them up front and then have them available for people um, and knowing that you guys would actually want that. So. Right, yeah. I'm, I'm, I tend to lean towards the, uh, the opinion of why would anyone want to wear my logo on their T-shirt? But you And know I'm what? of the opinion that of course you want to wear our logo because it's fun. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. But so, you know, let me know. Let us know in the comments if you're interested in something like that and we'll, we'll look into it. 
Um, this person wants to know what we would rather be, a transformer named Toaster Master with the ability to transform into a toaster and make almost perfect toast, or a G.I. Joe named Seafoam with the ability to attract small fish. I'd be the transformer. I would be Toast Master. Toaster well, Master. Likewise. Yeah, likewise. Uh, there's no question. Fish creep me out. Yep. Don't, not a fan. Not an ocean person. Not a fan. All right. Um... This person is asking about the many, uh, they say, what about the many lost flavors of Kool-Aid? I guess as an idea for us to do a video on. It's not toys, but Rockadile Red and Purple Saurus Rex should be looked into. Gives you a whole other angle of retro. Uh, it's funny that this gets brought up because there was actually uh, a, a large article on X Entertainment a few years ago about high C Ecto Cooler and how long it lasted and when it changed skew numbers and when it became another name, but it was still the same flavor and people were still tracking it down before it finally disappeared. And uh, There was a guy online recently on our Facebook who was trying to run a, a lost fast food uh, Facebook fan page. And uh, I think the problem with, with those is that while they would be great for you know, certain posts, and maybe if we could find enough information about them or ephemera to do, um, is it ephemera, ephemera, ephemera? I don't know. Uh, anyway, that word. Products. Uh, yes, paper paper merchandise, uh, as I mispronounce a word. Um, if we could uh, you know, get enough of that material together and then craft a script around it of good information to do a video, then I wouldn't be opposed to it. Uh, the challenge with food is that it gets consumed and then it, you know, the packaging gets thrown away. Um, Oddly, it's still very expensive to obtain. Uh, I know this because I, I did toy with the idea the first Halloween that we were up and running of doing like what the monster cereals. Um, it's not like it's never been done, um, but I wanted to, to talk about it because growing up I ate Count Chocula almost every day, which is probably not the greatest thing to admit, but it's true. So um, I, I thought it'd be fun to talk about it and the changes over time and, and the artwork and the contents and all that kind of stuff and how you can still get them, but only at at Halloween, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately I decided that it wasn't going to be the most interesting video, and you know I'm not gonna, you know, just sit there and eat a bowl of cereal in front of you guys. So I don't, I didn't really know where to go with it in terms of a discussion. So um, yeah. we certainly love to talk about it on Facebook, and you're more than welcome to share that kind of stuff there. But I just haven't found a way to really make a good video yeah. about it. If we ever find an angle, you can you can bet your bottom dollar that we will make a video about whatever it is that we found a good angle on. Uh, but yeah, it's it's harder to do that. You know, can we really do a whole video about the lost styrofoam igloos of McDonald's? I don't I don't know. I, I there's no way to really get your hands on them. So yeah, right. unless we just start digging through landfills. Right. All right, so now we're on to uh, the topic of collecting. Why do you collect toys? What triggered that nostalgia for trying to hunt down all the old toys you had as a kid? It just had to do with the fact that I've never not been interested in toys. I've always had an interest in toys. I've always had a fascination with them. Uh, I always loved the way they were designed, the way they were colored, the way they worked. Uh, you know, one toy line leads to the next, and there were so many toy lines that I was paying attention to as a child that I never even bothered asking my parents for. You know, my, my, my parents see me sometimes buying some of this stuff uh, when they, you know, come over or, or when I, they hear about, you know, the latest purchase or see the latest video. And, you know, they'll say, why'd you buy that? And I say, well, because I always wanted it. And they go, you did not. And I'm like, mom, dad, just because I never mentioned it to you as a kid doesn't mean I wasn't aware of it and wasn't interested in it. Kids don't, not every kid blathers on about everything they're into all the time. And, and I'm no exception. I saw so many of these toys and I was silently admiring some of them, even though as a kid you're calculating, you know that you're certainly invested in one line. And when you're a kid, you know that your money is limited by what your parents are willing to buy you. So you prioritize in your head. I mean, you do. You're like, well, I really, really like superpowers, but my par my parents are only going to buy me like one or two figures over the next three or four month period. And I've already got seven G.I. Joes. 
So I'm not going to waste my two purchasing opportunities on superpowers. I'm going to get more Joes. I mean, that's you don't even realize you were doing it back then, but you were. I mean, that that's what was happening. But that doesn't negate the fact that I wasn't interested in all these other toys. And so I just, when eBay came around in 1998 or 7 or whenever it was, mm -hmm. I was like, Oh my gosh, I can buy everything I've ever seen if I've just been, you know, if I'm just patient enough. I can acquire it, all of it. And some people would call that a sickness. <laughs> but it's really entertaining for me because I have like a razor sharp memory for back then. And so I see these things for the first time in a long time. It's like meeting old friends I never got to shake hands with, you know, 30 years ago. Mm. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I mean, I certainly loved My Little Ponies back then. Obviously, you guys know that. But I didn't have every single one of them. But if I really wanted to and I try really hard, I can probably get all of them. And uh, so that's kind of cool. It's, yeah. It's, um, what's the hardest line to collect so far, either due to rarity of existence, condition, or state? Is there a line that just can't be obtained and complete anymore? The hardest lines to collect so far. Um, I would have to say that a lot of lines, you can get 90% of it uh, fairly easily, even ones that have pieces that go for high prices. So for example, uh, in my eBay feed, I can tell you that it's pretty easy to get most of Robotech. But Robotech, people say it's rare because of that Macross SDF1 playset. But that's really the only piece of the Robotech Matchbox line that's hard to find. Um, I've actually found that it's harder to collect things like, um, well, for example, Visionaries. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to collect complete. Um, Karate Kid by Remco. Those are hard to find complete, and they don't come up as often. And when they do, they're usually incomplete or broken, and they don't come up enough for you to buy multiples to piece them together. They just, they just, they just don't. Um, I found that a lot of the action figures for LJN's Advanced Dungeons and Dragons are hard to come by, uh, to, co to cobble together complete ones. You either buy complete or you'll never have it complete. Um, I'm trying to think of some other lines where that, that's the case. I'll tell you the one that I'm interested in is, um, and this is why I don't voyage out into looking for these things, because I love really rare things, expensive things. So Model Trem is a Star Wars kind of knockoff thing. I think they use the molds of the plastic uh, Star Wars Kenner figures from the 80s and then they, they molded them in um, metal. metal and Lead. and so they're, they're made in South America and they're extremely rare, uh, but they're so super cool because they look just like the Kenner um, action figures, but they're metal and they are articulated to a degree and they're painted and they're just, they're so cool looking. I came across them a few months ago at a convention and ever since then I, I sort of constantly keep an eye out, you know, for some way to spend a few extra hundred dollars here and there. Yeah, they're lead, <laughs> they're lead Star Wars figures that are held together by metal posts, like metal nails. I mean, it's, they're really bizarre, but Melinda hey, I love, loves them. So. I love metal, you, so. you know that, so. Um, would you ever consider buying a bootleg and what is your opinion on buying or collecting bootlegs of various quality? There was a time where I toyed with the idea of buying a lion bot, which is a long standing bootleg of the uh, Beast King Go Lion, the, the Matchbox Voltron, the die cast one. Uh, and I always backed off of it and never did pull the trigger because that, that money could go towards something legit that we're working on for the, for the web channel. Uh, for retro blasting, I just I guess the reason I've never gotten into bootlegs is because it's once again about that razor sharp memory that I have for my uh, my childhood years. Um, I go after, and it's the same reason that I don't buy uh, prototypes and that I don't buy uh, a lot of um, only sold in Europe kinds of things. I'm really uh, attracted to toys that were available to me as a child that I remember in the stores that I never got to take home with me. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm not interested in things I never saw. 
I'm not I'm not someone that collects the rarest greatest thing like yeah there are some things I want to collect but I know that they were mass market um, it just doesn't really capture my interest to go after a bootleg of something I, I uh, you'd have to really give me a compelling argument to go after a bootleg me on the other hand I might go after a bootleg I certainly do go after um, things from Europe and, and all over the world that, that I never knew of as a kid, but that, that just strike my fancy. Well, model trim is a model, bootleg. Model trim, yeah, so exactly. Um, prototypes would be super interesting to me, um, things like that. So we're kind of different in that way about why we, you know, for me it's do I think it's cool right now? Not always did I think it was cool when I was seven. So not not insulting you no. at all, just saying that's that's how my mind works. If I see something, ooh, this is really cool. Let me let me. I I'm attracted to the familiar. Mm -hmm. I want I want to walk into my you know display room or whatever and and rummage through my own history. I don't want to rummage through a lost history of things that I didn't didn't know anything about or, you know, I don't. I'll never be interested in a rocket firing Boba Fett. I don't care. Me, on the other hand. I could kind of go there. So. I just don't. I don't care. Um, now we're going to specifically talk that that leads it well into this um, about our childhood toys. So, have you guys had to restore most of the toys you had when you were kids? Uh, well, you've seen me restore my Millennium Falcon, and you've seen me restore my Death Star. Um, as beyond that, it's really been more about um, putting lost accessories back with the the completing. toys yeah completing them so lost weapons lost missiles lost parts uh not a lot of broken stuff really needing restoration i was pretty careful with my toys uh and i think i've said that on many videos um but uh, melinda can tell you more about restoring her childhood stuff because it it's like a totally different animal yeah uh a lot of my stuff, for a variety of reasons that I won't bore you with, uh, got kind of messed up. You saw me finding the toys in the attic and things like that. Um, so I really did have to do a lot of cleaning on the ponies. Because of where the toys were stored, some of the, them are not salvageable. Like my strawberry shortcakes, for example, are now discolored because of the heat in the attic where they were stored. So um, there's really not any saving that. Um, but it's sort of... I haven't finished going through all of the other toys. I've really been focusing on My Little Pony. Uh, I guess at some point I may get sick of that and, you know, go on to something else. But right now I kind of can't imagine that because there are so many ponies that I can buy um, and track down. Well, and also she's having to restore or clean up a lot of them because of, you know, hair damage or just, you know, needing them to be washed, things like that. Yeah. Uh, but the bulk of my experience with my childhood stuff has been more about completion less than restoration, which is why when you see a lot of the restoration videos we do, it's it's parts that have or parts or vehicles or toys that have come in from outside uh, that we are adding to our collection that need help uh, rather than the other way around for me. Yeah, um, and this one is kind of the same question, but a little different. How many of your childhood toys managed to survive all these years and do you display them in a special place? And then another version of that is with such a massive amount of stuff, how do you organize and or display your collection? Well, I can answer that question two ways. Uh, we have two display cases in our living room where we rotate out uh, their glass door display cases where we rotate out, you know, different toys as we, you know, get interested in them or, you know, just want to see them on display for a little while. Uh, the bulk of it is here. I mean, the bulk of it, well, is, you can't here. see all around us, but all around us in this uh, this basement room, uh, in organized in bins, are all of the toys that you see in our videos. It's sort of a big toolbox. And one day, I hope to have a larger space where I can display all of these things uh, in the same way they're displayed in glass cases and not just in bins, so that I can then show you all of the stuff uh, in an interesting way. Because right now, if I gave you a tour of our archive, uh, you'd be like, wow, that's a lot of Rubbermaid bins. And I'd be like, yeah. Uh, so one day they will all be on display, hopefully in the very near future. All right, so now we're down to stuff that our fans want to see, which is, you know, every time we, we do 
a video that's even kind of like this, we get lots of requests, which is great. You know, it shows that you guys are, are watching and thinking about, hey, I'd love to see you guys review this. And so that's awesome. Um, but so mm. I don't know if you if you want me to go through all these. I'm pretty sure that most of the answers to these are going to be, yeah, uh, we're, we're working on that. And for a variety of reasons, just haven't done the video yet. Um, but first on the list is Starfleet and Terrahawks, which are two early 80s puppet shows that came off the back of Star Wars with very limited lines of toys and merchandise. Which one of those would do we prefer as a show and a line, and would you do specials on either of them? Well, I'd be willing to do specials on anything from that, that period of time. Uh, one thing everybody has to keep in mind, and it, it's something that I think would uh, is, is of benefit for everybody to realize, is that television markets back then were very independent. You know, nowadays corporations own all of these TV networks. But back then there were a lot of public channels. In Nashville it was Channel 17. And the, in all your different markets you had different channels that you would tune into with your rabbit ears to watch, you know, Yogi Bear and Chili Willy and all that stuff in the afternoon when you got home from, from school. And because of that, not all of these channels carried all of the same stuff. Meaning that somebody who grew up watching Terra Hawks, wherever you are, I never heard of it. I'd never heard of it because it never reached the Nashville market that I'm aware of. And if you didn't have cable back then, and I didn't have cable back yeah. then, you were even less exposed to uh, the variety of stuff that was out there. I think my parents had cable for a trial run for six months. And that's how I know about that show Trans or Z. Other than that, I would have never known about it. Um, yeah, in my market, uh, I watched a lot of shows that a lot of people don't seem to remember, and I, I always used to wonder why. So, like, Sport Billy, for example, was a German cartoon uh, that, oddly, I liked, but it's a sports-themed cartoon, which now is like, why would I be interested in that? But so, I had a Sport Billy lunchbox, and it was like... To me, I thought that was a big cartoon that a lot of people had heard of. Same with Thundar. It was my favorite cartoon as a kid. But, you know, most kids were familiar more with, like, Care Bears and Smurfs and, you know, Muppet Babies or whatever. Right. So. And that and that was also due to the fact that on Saturday mornings, the networks would take over some of the channels and then show the network-run cartoons. But in the afternoon, the afternoon market uh, on weekdays... Uh, everybody's region was different because the independent stations would run different stuff. Uh, so, for example, I never knew that Robotech, uh, I never got to see Robotech as a show. I only knew the toys were in the stores. Uh, the show never ran in my market. So, if I can ever find information on this stuff, then I'll happily do a video about it. So, I'm going to run through a couple of the, the, the rest of these. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is, are we going to review the vintage 12-inch Star Wars figures? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Yes, we are. As a matter of fact, I have, I have a little Princess Leia right here. I don't know if you can see her through the plastic. We did not plan that. Uh, no, we didn't plan it. But yes, I have a number of the 12-inch uh, Star Wars characters. This is a second Princess Leia I have. I have a much nicer one that we'll, we'll show on camera. But yes, I do plan to do these in the future. I just have to acquire more of them. Right now, I only have uh, four or five of them. And my Darth Vader's arms fell off. So, yeah. Mm. Resto video. Um, when can you do a video about tiger sharks? You know, I am so excited about the idea of doing tiger sharks. Um, first of all, because it's the third part of, you know, the Thundercats, Silverhawks, uh, thing and and secondly because the toys are so rare like you said and I already admitted on here that I really do enjoy the rare expensive toys right dear yes and you do <laughs> I wouldn't be a woman if I didn't like the most expensive thing in the room so um but yeah I, th I think it'd be really cool to do the tiger sharks most of what is keeping us from doing it is the expense of the toys as well as getting a really good complete copy of the the cartoon series. So if anybody out there has a, a, even a VHS of the Tiger Sharks, that would be awesome. Like I'd love to have the whole series and be able to to subject him to watching the whole thing. I've watched several episodes online, so I, I kind of know what I'm asking for. But, but yeah, yeah, and I should point that out. But it also tracks back to an earlier question about the hardest toy lines to collect. Um, Tiger Sharks and Galaxy Rangers are two of the hardest toy lines to collect because they're just, for us, we like to collect complete. And when it comes to rare stuff like that, 
you really don't want to jump in and commit your money to something that's not complete, even though it's the first one you've seen in six months. Because for us, it would still be worthless because we wouldn't be able to do anything with it on camera immediately. We'd have right. to wait. Um, so tiger sharks are really difficult because they weren't out very long. They weren't made in large numbers. I remember them as a kid on clearance, and I didn't buy them. Um, I wish I had because they're uh, worth so much. Foresight. Yeah, I have so much money now. But the ones you find aren't complete, and they take forever to pop up uh, online. So we'd love to do it, but it's hard to get access to the cartoon and the toys. It will happen. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. Uh, the Kenner's Raiders of the Lost Ark toys. Kenner's Raiders of the Lost Ark toys in this archive right now behind this camera, as I'm pointing right over there. The complete entire Kenner Raiders of the Lost Ark line is sitting in that bin right there, ready to go on camera. Uh, I just have to script it and get it rolling. I'm hoping to do that video in late summer. So I'm hoping that you'll see that video in August. I think you already mentioned Starcom. Starcom, we are going to do a video about. I'm trying to track down a few extra pieces. And I need to get the show. And Inhumanoids. Inhumanoids is a gap in the, the archive. We have two Inhumanoids uh, creatures uh, in our toy collection right now. They're from when I was a kid. Uh, I need to get Metlar and Decompose and Tendril and then some of the human characters. And when I have those, I will definitely do an Inhumanoids video. Um, the aircraft carrier, the G.I. Joe USS Blag. Yeah, the G once again, the aircraft carrier... A lot of people ask this. So. Yeah, the aircraft carrier is kind of like uh, the Macross SDF-1 playset. If you're going to buy it for, for our purposes, i got to get it complete. And I can't ever find it complete for a price that uh, would justify it right now. And, and that's really regarding the SDF-1. Um, the USS Flag is another problem entirely. Uh, it really is. It, uh, it's expensive. It does come up complete, um, but I would have no place to put it. I have no Seriously. place to put it right now. And I live in a three-story home, well, two-and-a-half-story home. Uh, it's just so big, and uh, it's very expensive. And it would, it would, and I'm, you know me, you've seen my videos. I'm not above, you know, uh, trying to avoid spending what's, what's worth it on, uh, you know, a piece for for a video i will go to the nines for my audience to make sure that you see the complete whatever it is uh but in the case of the uss flag it's a matter of space uh it's also a matter of the prices that are being demanded right now um so i'm hoping to to have that happen uh one day i saw one recently um it was complete and it was opened but it had never been assembled but it was twenty five hundred dollars so what I'm actually hoping to do is possibly find somebody that has a complete one and then do a feature video uh, showcasing that person's flag. Uh, to, because to be completely honest with you, and I, I've said this in some presentations uh, that you might have seen online, I'm just not really that interested in the USS flag for my collection. And I know that's like, wait, what? It's like a Holy Grail piece. Well, yeah, but it's it just I'm just not that into boats. So... Well, plus it's it's one of those play it's a playset which we do collect a lot of those we have a lot of them which they're very big, um, but it's not something that you play with. It's sort of like a giant table for you to put all of the other GI Joe right. things on. Um, it's very impressive and certainly in terms of a big display room or something like that, it would be a cool thing to have there. Um, but I would almost want to mount it sideways on the wall. Right. You know, so that it doesn't take up. I mean, because you would want to display it, right? So, I don't know. My artist mind is thinking, how would I put that in a room and not? I will take the terror drone twenty times over before I take the flag. I mean, I just will. I think the terror drone is super cool, and I think it's a nice compliment to the GI Joe headquarters. I just, I, I mean, I'll, I will do a video on the flag one day. It might not end up being my flag. It will be a complete flag, mm. but it will not be mine. Um, and I guess the last one is, are we going to do any more top 10 videos? <laughs> uh, Michael loves top 10 videos. I mean, yeah, we're going to do more top 10 videos at some point. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, finding the time and finding the right top 10 list to do. Didn't we come up with one? It was like top 10. 
I thought we talked about it. A few... It's a problem as we come up with all these ideas, and if we aren't near something to write it down on, it, it just you know. Right. Well. So... Yeah. I know we came up with one one time, but yeah, we'll do we'll do we'll do more top ten videos in the future. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in top 10 videos, you have suggestions, we always love to hear from you guys, no matter what. So, you know, send us some, some comments below or message us on the Facebook page and um, we'll definitely put it on our long, long to-do list of, of things to do. And, and, you know, we look forward to hearing more from you and putting out some more videos at the end of the year, this year. Yeah. And um, I think convention season's finally over. So, finally. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, we hope to be putting out a lot more videos soon, and we'll be seeing you. Yeah, thanks so much. Really appreciate you guys always watching our stuff, and we'll continue to make it if you continue to watch it. Uh, send us comments. Send us emails. Send us suggestions. Littlefoot says goodbye. So we will see you on the next video. Bye.